Listen. Now, the first time we did this video, it got hit multiple times by the studio. So not only is this a reminder to the studio intern that, hey, it's a review uh, and I could prove it because y'all did. The main part that they claimed the first time around was the literal critique of a scene and not anything else that showcased footage. Like, I can't even make this up. They really wanted me to keep in the part where I say, but the restaurant scene? Yo, I love it. But then time stamped it so that I had to cut out everything after that conveniently from this point and hate it at the same time <laughs> up to the entire critique where I'm giving my point. So studio intern, stop being lame and quit ghosting my video. Now back to me. I still remember when this movie had come out in theaters. They had a hashtag on Twitter that was only visible if you were in dark mode, meaning that everyone on light mode couldn't see anything. Like always. But this movie also spawned from the disaster that was the Universal Monsters Cinematic Universe. Pretty much at that point, every studio wanted their own Marvelous franchise, but none of them knew how to get it. They all took pictures, though. If you recall, Universal's plan started with The Mummy, which they couldn't even sync the audio for in the trailers. <laughs> So instead of having Javier Bardem play Frankenstein, Depp play the Invisible Man, and Russell Crowe play himself, they went to their boy Blum, and when Jason heard he'd save money on effects since there wasn't going to be anything there, he said, sign me up. It was a lack of visual effects that would make it special, like just pointing the camera at an empty room. You know, the emptiness is the special effect. Or more accurately, the audience's imagination is the special effect. They can conjure up in their mind something far more terrifying than you can physically conjure up. That said, we know not every movie in Blum's house always delivers, many times because of the cheaper budget, but when you trick a pro when you get a professional like Lee one out who did Saw, who booted up the Insidious franchise, how he had just an upgrade for less than half the budget of this movie, then there's hope. So not only did Lee make a great movie, but dude knew how to spend that budget so well that he had enough left over to prank Blum. That was a scene that was cut. Yeah, yeah. The there's a few more. The most expensive there's... scene that yeah. we shot on the yeah. whole movie, yeah. I just found out he cut it. No, it was not in you the movie. You think I'd know, but I didn't. That's a combo price from me. Let me explain. So in case you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it, and I highly recommend going in blind, so major spoiler warning right here. But just know that Moss is like Moe's from Ned's Declassified. She never turns in a bad project. I loved it. I did um, a small part in Jordan Peele's movie Us. Okay. And yeah. that was where I sort of discovered, like, oh, this is my genre. <laughs> because basically you can do, like, the craziest <laughs> and everyone loves it. So a quick recap. We follow an architect named Cecilia, or C if you want to be on the nose, who's trapped in an abusive relationship with a tech mogul named Adrian. Obviously, he's not in it for a lot of it, but some of you may remember Oliver Cohen from The Haunting of Hill House. And now he's haunting his house, so C decides to run away one night with her sister in order to escape all of this manipulation, which I guess was so effective that some people were even on Adrian's side at the end of the movie. Now, I'm not one to deny someone's interpretation of a film. I'm just someone who saw Adrian turn into Rocky in the trailer. I'm not saying that a future sequel can't wreck on it, since, you know, nowadays everybody does that, but considering the research the team did with this one, Adrian may be good looking, but he ain't good. In fact, this dude's so crazy that he fakes his death, engineers his own Harry Potter cloak suit, and then decides to stalk his wife by ruining her cooking. As creepy as it is, and you know, trust me, the sound design in this movie makes it feel like they have someone standing on the corner of the bedroom or behind you, but it is to some degree funny. Like, does Griffin have a syllabus as he's wandering around the house? On Wednesday, the only thing he has to do is start a fire. Thursday, snap a pig. Friday, play in the attic. He ends up sabotaging her interview, even returns her pills from beyond the grave. And that's the point where, you know, I would have just scooby-dooed myself in the room with some booby traps and documented everything from my phone for proof. But it, it really showcases the message of the movie, where the elite feel that power and money buy you people. Previous incarnations and inspirations of Griffin always had us following the Invisible Man, but by switching to the victim's perspective, everything is way creepier. You know, he's manipulating her medication, gaslighting her. Just by being a wealthy tech exec who funded the company from Upgrade, he's able to get away with so much. And so we get a story that both Lee and Moss did extensive research for. So, you know, I really hope they don't backtrack it for sequels. I think they do a very effective job with building that tension and perspective in the first act. I don't know what happened during this act right here, but then I think it has a dope ending. The best part of the middle section, it it has to be the stunt work. It's like, have, it looks like a giant green condom. Uh-huh. So you have this like giant green condom coming at you, which is scary. Yeah, sure. 
Moss had a robotic camera follow her and her stunt woman, getting chalked by Kermit while they were doing their scenes, while Aldous Hodges actually threw himself for his. I did a fight scene with a stunt double, but this guy did a fight <laughs> scene with himself? With myself. It was yes. incredible, honestly. You've seen it. I don't know, seen it. That I don't know I either. I just in bed at night. Basically, <laughs> that, that's what you do? Just, yeah, just wake up. Those what? are the blankets. It was unbelievable, like, honestly, look at Hodges. Like, really, look at Hodges. Tell me an invisible suit is going to give you invincible strength. He could have taken Griffin and his brother. Man, eyes closed. That and the fact that nobody knew how to hold a weapon in this movie was like really irking me. I'll give Moss a pass, obviously. But an issued officer? Have none of y'all seen Collateral? Where things go really haywire is when Adrian makes them think that C knocked the crap out of Sydney, and uh, when her and her sister split the bill. Look, setting up the Sydney slap is crazy because at that point, who's going to believe that your ex is walking around in a state-of-the-art optical cloaking device with a syllabi of pranks? Enough. But the restaurant scene, yo, I love it and hate it at the same time. It's got that shock factor that made my recliner take an extra step back, but. Where is this knife? At this point, the sister notices, right? We're gonna go frame by frame. She notices it here. The knife is clearly, easily it's behind Cecilia at this point. But then it slices across the table and now it's on the sister's right. But then it shoots from the sister's left right into C's hand who... How? I damn near was playing a game of Twister, wondering how the Invisible Man was was weaving his knife around this table. But since C held it sturdy and Taylor finally stopped checking out the table, C gets sent to a ward for killing her sister. They dress her in Yeezy 8s, and then we realize that the brother has been in on this the whole time. We'll be watching. Maybe there is a third suit and they were just playing catch here, but when you first meet him, you actually feel sympathetic for the brother because he was probably always abused and, you know, he was even led to believe that his brother died only for him to come back and bamboozle him. And then I realized, nah, this dude legit was going to go kill a little girl when he already had the invisible suit. Y you're just as guilty. You're just the jellyfish version of him. Everything but the spine. Then we go bonkers. While the invisible man is in the room, C cuts a two inch wound to get his attention. She stabs him like crazy just for him to be fine, but it conveniently causes the suit to glitch whenever it's convenient. Like I love the blocking going on here, minus the social distancing that this man's doing with his gun, but it was that glitching that seemed to be, you know, convenient whenever they needed it to be. As C escapes, as a lawyer brother lies dead in one of the invisible suits, Adrian somehow finds a way to tie himself up and pins everything on the brother as if he was also a victim. And while I'd question why they didn't check his fresh wounds, they also left the dog behind this whole time, so you know, C sees to it. She returns home to confront Adrian, who, surprise, is obviously still a scumbag. He's making sure not to get anything on tape for James, who's outside. But C knows you can't see audio, so she puts on the second suit hidden in the bathroom and finally splits up with Adrian. I just hope the cops don't figure out the other suit, because then you're screwed with this footage. Dracula is supposed to be terrifying. You know, now I watch cartoons where he's voiced by Adam Sandler, right? It's It's more of a... It's more of a cartoonish thing now, the cape and the voice. I think I think there is a way to make these characters scary again. That's why they've lasted so long. It is crazy to think how disgusting and vile we make villains, but audiences are always so compelled by them. Like, you know that if Netflix had the rights to this, they would have focused on the mind of Adrian instead and his, dis his disturbed genius. Luckily, they flipped the switch here and we don't have to follow another creepy Kevin Bacon doing creepy Kevin Bacon things. And I think they were going to have Johnny Depp do this, but I love how Universal exists are no longer, get this, hearing pitches and reading scripts that tie monsters together and instead are telling filmmakers that storytelling is the star. You don't say. I am always going to be a bigger fan of the filmmaker-driven approach over, you know, paying big-name actors just to be on the poster. And if it means that more movies like this over The Mummy will get made, then I'm all for it. Supposedly they have in the works Paul Feig directing a Dark Army movie, Dexter Fletcher and Robert Kirkman are handling a movie about Dracula's henchmen, James Wan is producing the new Frankenstein, Amy Pascal wants Sam Raimi to do Bride of Frankenstein, and even Elizabeth is hoping to bank on her version of The Invisible Woman, which she's directing, producing, and starring in unrelated to the movie as of now. But as for The Invisible Man, it may have its glitches here and there, but the atmosphere, performances, and suspense is all there, telling the story of a woman who no longer has to lay awake at night, but can finally close her eyes and be free.
Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. As always, big shout out to these guys for releasing it. You can catch it early. Out of all the movies that are out right now, I'd say um, this would probably be one of my favorites. I don't know how they're going to do the Oscars this year. Imagine all the movies come out and uh, this this sweeps the Oscars, just gets all the categories. Uh, maybe Rich Brian will be available for a nomination because it was really cool that he had a song on here that, that was featured. Um, I also really like the gorgeous backdrop for the opening credits. I, I thought it looked beautiful, probably worth half the budget right there. Um, but I thought it was an interesting movie again uh there definitely is like a theming to the movie about abuse so i don't i don't see it being as open interpretation like other people do i know some people had the question about like whether she keeps the baby and uh, up to her but i'm curious to see what people think about this movie moss had also mentioned being up for a marvel movie she just hasn't been asked surprisingly but uh, she mentioned wanting to be a villain and that would be insane i would love for her to be like the next Thanos that they're building up to um but other than that i'm curious to know your thoughts it'll be interesting considering blumhouse's average so far for this year in my opinion is uh a one to two but they still got some other stuff coming out uh until then curious to know your thoughts on this don't forget to comment like and subscribe and that person at the door will